Why did you stop me from killing her? Tell me while you're still alive. No, I was born with black skin. You were born with a black skin? Yes. Interesting. Someone must know something. I wish to learn. Read a book. I would rather have a good composition. Typical. Selfish. You think like a human. <laughs> I have enjoyed this conversation in English. Hello, my name is John and I'm a public historian and your Japanese history enabler. This is the show where I put a podcaster or podcasters through their paces as they discover Japanese history through the lens of popular media and film. And our special guests this week are Thomas and Heather of the Japan Archives podcast. Hello. Hi. What are your guys' backgrounds in experiencing Japanese media? Heather, you can go first. Are you going to make me start? Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I probably got in to Japanese media probably via anime as probably the first thing. I watched Studio Ghibli. My first Studio Ghibli movie, I think, was Princess Mononoke. And mm. I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> and it was an interesting experience. Since watched some Japanese dramas. I watch Japanese movies. Kind of similar to have like when I was still back in England, my first experience of Japan was kind of anime and manga. My first one was Death Note. Oh. Really old school one.、Um, I managed to also get my dad into it. Like he watched and read it with me. So it was kind of cool. And then, like, through my education, I kind of steered towards. Um, history and then into archaeology. And I worked there for a while. And I realized I had my love for history. And when I was little, it was, I think, for everyone when you're little, you like Egyptian history. And then slowly I discovered Japan and their history and got super into that. And then that's kind of one of the things that led me to living here in Japan and meeting Heather and having our own show. Like, I wanted to come here to experience the history firsthand. And ever since I've been here, like, it's just. Fueled me more and more to want to learn more and understand their stories, like not just their history, but like all the fairy tales and myths、mm. that they have here as well. It's just super interesting. So, you guys do a history based podcast where you look at like stories from Japanese history and also a lot of the folklore and things behind it. So, what、mm. would you say your knowledge about broader Japanese history is? A lot of our stuff is singular episode based, like、yeah. it's a topic we can cover in one. Episode like a Japanese fairy tale or a new story from Shinto mythology, or if we do history. Well, some of we find interesting. We do、mm. had, we、um, did have like a longer、uh, few of series of episodes、yes. on the samurai. And generally, something that we find interesting is t a period of time that we might have read an article about or seen something that just draws us in that we find intriguing. So we've kind of dabbled in. A lot of different eras yeah, and a lot of different time、around. periods.、Mm. Yeah. Specifically, you haven't focused so much on this week's time period. This time period, <laughs> no. There's a lot going on in this time period, and it would be hard to do in one episode. Even like in 10 episodes,、yeah. you couldn't cover the whole thing.、Mm-mm. So that's the challenge. And what did you watch? Yeah, we watched The Last Samurai. Well, I watched it again, but Heather、it's、had my first the time. Yeah, first、oh. time today. Oh. I missed it. <laughs> it is, of course, the Oscar nominated Last Samurai、yeah. uh, nominated. from 2003, starring Tom Cruise and Watanabe Ken,、uh, mm-hmm. directed by Edward Zwick. It's set at the beginning of the Meiji period of Japanese history.、Mm-hmm. Tom Cruise plays Nathan Ulgren, a United States cavalry officer who is hired to go to Japan and train an army to take down the rebellion of Watanabe Ken's Katsumoto Moritsugu. But When Nathan is captured and he learns the way of these people, will that change how he views his life and the decisions he has yet to make in the future? It, it dances with wolves in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. I missed that one too. What? <laughs> I have gaps in my education. Oh my gosh. So, the historians that will be joining us this week are the wonderful Dr. E. Taylor Atkins of the University of Northern Illinois and an expert in popular Japanese culture. Indeed, his book, A History of Popular Culture in Japan, is excellent and has been a key resource throughout the series. There's also a second edition coming out this autumn that I will keep on recommending. It's great.
And our second historian is the super Dr. Alexander Bennett of Kansai University, who is an expert in Bushido studies and samurai culture. He holds mm. the rank of Kendo Kyoshi Seventh Dan and has recently translated the Hagakure and the Book of the Five Rings into English, which are traditional pieces of samurai literature. He also writes on Japanese warrior culture and the concepts of Bushido as a whole. All this film is based loosely on the historic events of real-life figures Jules Brunet, a French artillery officer, and a man called Saigo Takamori, who is widely considered the real last samurai after his death in the 1877 Satsuma Rebellion that Mm. the movie is loosely based on. However... Before we get to them, we will be looking at an entire section of what happened before all this. In our final section, we'll be discussing how impactful films like this can be on our views of different countries, and especially how films like The Last Samurai can contribute to elements of modern day Orientalism, especially. But now, in terms of time period, we're talking about events from roughly the 1850s to the 1880s. So if you're around the world, the history, that means that Europe is rocked by revolutions in the year of 1848. The Crimean War between Russia and the forces of France, the UK and the Ottoman Empire is being fought. The American Civil War is being fought. The British fight and win both opium wars in China, enforcing and ensuring they could continue to sell totally harmless opium. (laughs) Uh, it's not totally harmless guys germany and italy become countries proper as we know them today and the suez canal is opened connecting the mediterranean to the red sea so it's an eventful time definitely an eventful time i didn't realize so much had actually happened (laughs) you always learn about these things individually Mm -hmm. you never go oh wait that Mm -hmm. happened then that happened then that happened then that happened In terms of Japanese history, this is the end of the Edo period and the beginning of the Meiji period. Hmm. And now I need to discuss period names. So the Meiji period covers Japanese history from 1868 to 1912, Mm -hmm. covering the time from when the emperor is restored to near absolute power after being essentially a pawn for the last 600 to 700 years. Hmm. And it ends with the emperor's death. And since the periods are structured now up to the modern day, to the length of the emperor's life. I mean, you live in Japan, so you should hopefully know what the era we are in currently. Yeah, yes. we're now in Reiwa. Now, for everyone at home, the Meiji period is not named after the emperor Meiji. It's important to understand in Japanese, you never call the emperor by a name. Mm. Like, you don't call the king, King Henry. He is just the king, because who else would you be talking about? True. <laughs> Hmm. So Japanese, he is Tenno Heika, His Majesty the Emperor, or Kinjo Tenno, the current emperor, who we now know as the Emperor Meiji, had a personal name, Mutsuhito. However, that's only ever used in like his personal signature. It's never hmm. used on any proper documents. Now, there used to be smaller era names, which they're called Nengo, and you could have multiple within one person's rule. For example, under Mutsuhito's father, there had been six Nengo. The longest being seven years, shortest being two years. There are multiple rules that govern their names and how long they are. And they scare me, basically. (laughs) I don't understand. But just before the Emperor Meiji's coronation in 1868, it was announced there would only be one. One period, one rule. The choice was Meiji. So Meiji means enlightened rule. Mm. Ah, mm. And the emperor, after their death, would be given a posthumous name to distinguish them from all the other emperors that came before them. And so he is now known by the name of the Nengo from when he was alive. So he is the emperor Meiji because he was the emperor during the Meiji Mm -hmm. period. Uh, So, for example, the current emperor, when he dies, will be known as the Emperor Reiwa. The Causes of the Meiji Restoration So this is a time that is called the Bakamatsu, and that means the end of the Bakufu. And for people at home, the Bakufu is a term given to the Japanese military government that was led by the Tokugawa family. And so this period is called the Tokugawa period occasionally, but mostly the Edo period because their government base was in Edo, which was the name for now... Tokyo. (laughs) 
Now, to understand what's going on, we talked about before how the Crimean War is happening, the Opium Wars are happening. There is huge amount of opposition to the Tokugawa government and essentially fear in Japan that these big new industrial colonial empires are going to come and do the same to Japan that they did to China. Yeah. And so one of the main oppositions is in places like in the areas that are now Yamaguchi Prefecture or uh, Satsuma, uh, which is down in southern Kyushu. They're the main opposition to the Tokugawa government. This is during the time that Japan has a national seclusion, which is called Sakoku, which limits foreign trade to the city of Nagasaki and people from leaving the country. Essentially, there are loads of military families who are unhappy. They have no way to become, like, to get any titles or strength. Uh, It's essentially everyone has been in the same hereditary position for a hundred years. And also, all the samurai are getting into huge amounts of debt because they're not allowed to do, like, trade, etc., because of the social systems. However, the closure to Western powers ends with the arrival of Commodore Perry. Oh, thank you I knew it was a Commodore, but the rest escaped me. My history teacher is now crying. (laughs) Here, somewhere in the background. (laughs) He arrived in 1854, and essentially his steamboats and rifles were cutting edge compared to many of their Japanese counterparts, which were still trained with 17th century muskets. And through this threat of overwhelming military force, Perry forced the government to make concessions, which led to a further treaty called the Harris Treaty. And essentially, this technological unpreparedness would be crucial in the government's eventual downfall. There are those who were very much in touch with this, including a philosopher at the time uh, from Choshu called Yoshida Shoen, who actually attempts to sneak aboard Perry's ship and goes and asks to be taken to America. And this comes from the very, like, popular slogans of the time which you might have heard of which are sono joy which means revere the emperor expel the barbarian which you might feel a bit confused well why is he trying to sneak to america then because another popular phrase was wakon yosai which means japanese spirit western technology so this very much idea of we need to learn from western powers to defend ourselves from western powers I think you can still kind of feel that sometimes today in Japan mm. with how they are like the their companies and stuff they still use a lot of western stuff but they change it in such a way that they can still think it's still Japanese it's still unique in a way so it's interesting that the idea has lasted for so long the imperial loyalists are opposed to foreign cooperation and they're angry at the government concessions. So the imperial loyalists are people who are like, we want the emperor totally in charge. And the Bakufu loyalists are essentially attempting to maintain their own power and prevent the Western exploitation of Japan whilst also modernizing. And of course, there's also multiple incidents with other Western powers. Um, so consulates are firebombed, There's a murder of a British merchant, which then also leads to um, British warships and other foreign warships bombarding uh, ports, etc. And both sides are modernizing as fast as they can. And essentially, most of the Western powers are playing both sides as well. Yeah. This leads to a major defeat of the Bakufu's forces in 1866, which leads them to try to modernize at a much faster speed, but it's a bit too late. This, however, includes them visiting Paris and actually taking part in the 1867 World Fair. Oh, cool. Well, that was not expected. No, I didn't see that coming. (laughs) Some of the separate domains are also at the World Fair and they are given different little tents because they (laughs) they can't share the same one. Oh, goodness. Uh, Each one was doing their own thing. Many of the samurai who are at at this point, they're young, they've not really had any experience of conflict or war, but many Mm. of them are very angry with them basically cooperating with foreign powers. And this leads to the Boshin War of 1868 to 1869. Essentially, the Tokugawa shogun, uh, Tokugawa Yoshinobu, he resigns in favour of the emperor, basically going, okay, I can't do any of this anymore. As long as the Tokugawa stay in some kind of power and influence, it's okay. But I'm not going to, we won't be the total top dog anymore. Mm. However, lots of people don't like that the Tokugawas are still trying to get away with this. (laughs) 
Uh, of course. It, including one man who you should remember the name of, Saigo Takamori. Uh, mm. This leads to the Choshu and Satsuma forces, essentially with another rebellious domain called the Toza. Uh, they enforce a coup d'etat and declare a restoration of the emperor to total full power, which is something that we haven't seen since 1185 CE. Mm. So both sides of the time were modernized. They had rifles, they had artillery, they had modern tech. However, the imperial side had a huge amount of advantages. One of them included, they had a Gatling gun. Yeah, we saw that. We saw that. We saw that on the movie. <laughs> yeah. Wait, sorry, spoiler alert for people who haven't seen it yet. <laughs> 2003. Come on, spoilers are acceptable by this point. But, but I also want to remind you that it's the imperial side that is the most advanced, a.k.a. Mm. Saigo Takamori, the last samurai's side. Yes, true. Mm. They do change a lot in the battle yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well that's a bit later we're seven years earlier here uh -huh. however there are a huge mix of equipment most of the bakufu size the the military governments they were still using smooth bore muskets including some tanashigama matchlocks which their design comes from the 1600s mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah okay this is the late 1860s the war was surprisingly quick um, Saigo Takamori uh, led an imp led the imperial side to quickly capture Edo and the Tokugawa shogun. However, the um, parts of the navy refused to surrender and flee, and they established a short-lived republic of Ezo in Hokkaido uh, with the help of some French officers, which we'll talk about later. The imperial side wins, ushering in the Meiji period, creating a new government, but the main things that happen is there is a focus on centralization, of trying to create a Japan that is then strong enough to fight off other powers. Uh, daimyo titles and the samurai like class is gotten rid of. Daimyos are replaced with non-hereditary governors. It's this idea that hopefully you can like, create a more meritocratic society. There's a, a phrase at the time that even a peasant's son could get a name through work because that was one of the main criticisms of the old uh, Tokugawa regime. I think this is a perfect time to hear from Dr. Alexander Bennett, where he describes this type of nation building that is happening at this point in Japan. This was a time when Japan, as a modern nation state, was engaged in a, in a process of colonial expansion and also developing a, a new national identity. Uh, what is it to be Japanese? This is something that was never really, uh, until the Meiji period, when Japan opened up to the world and suddenly they're on the world stage so where do we position ourselves as a nation among all the other nations and this is the time where things like bushido started to become utilized as a very uh, useful historical heritage if you like or legacy that that could be adopted from a, a very small elite group that existed in japanese society especially in the tokugawa period we're talking about a very elite group that made up no more than six or seven perhaps seven percent of the population when after the Meiji restoration where these uh, the status of samurai and all the other dismantled and all the uh, the old ways of thinking from the uh, the backward past were discarded in favor of bringing in western technology and and other learnings and systems suddenly everybody is okay we are subjects of the emperor we are um, citizens of Japan, what is it that makes us different? What is it that makes Japanese people tick? And this is when uh, these ideas of Bushido started to really blossom. People started to sort of draw on the past to sort of create something uh, something new and something people could be proud of being a part of. You know, anybody who's uh, studied history around this period in any country will have come across the term invented tradition where you know past cultural legacies are brought back to life in a different form well you see even with like tourism and things here and something i encountered is like the older people 70s 80s um who when i tell them i'm interested in like japanese culture and history they go oh you should learn that and then you should teach that to the young people because no one really cares about that so much anymore but then you see all of the advertisements for like inter-country tourism to try to get people here interested in going to different prefectures because of this particular part of history there's an element of trying to make people like proud of their own history but there's also how much is that how much is that an invention 
the characters of The Last Samurai. Let's look at Captain Nathan Olgren. What were your impressions of this character when you first saw him on screen? He was a washed up American alcoholic um, who had a lot of issues and his, I guess, his PTSD from his fighting with the Native Americans and massacring, but but yeah. not, but he didn't want to. Mm. Um, He's very conflicted. He was told to do it, so, yeah. he, but I mean, he still did it, but, you know, that's an entirely different thing. But I think overall, like, the character development, like, if we just look at it as a film and not compare it to the history, like, the character development was good, and he was, like, willing to change. He wanted to learn about his, I guess, enemy. Um, and... Well, I, I like the character development. But. Well, the initial meeting is like, haven't we been here before? Like, it felt like this is a character, like, I guess you could immediately be drawn in and kind of relate because you've seen this kind of character, this kind of person, even probably in real life. Like, it's been, it's been done quite a lot, mm. I guess. How much of this character do you think was historical in any way? Well, I know for a fact... He was supposed to be French, so <laughs> already I mean, the country's wrong. He was a man, so they um, got that right. But he was he was in the military. Mm -hmm. He is loosely based on a French captain called Jules Brunet. I will say the sources here in English are extremely limited, as they're mostly in French or Japanese. Uh, so the majority of this affair, I'll be recounting some information from Richard Sims' book, uh, French Policy Towards the Bakufu and Meiji Japan of 1854 to 95. Brunet is born the son of an army vet in 1838. Uh, he studies, becomes an artillery officer in the French army. He does actually go and fight in America somewhere, do you want to try and guess where someone would be fighting in America in the 1860s? I mean, you, you've got, what, the whole country at this point. So I, I was, well, he did, go, did he go towards uh, Canada border, perhaps? Wrong way. Uh, he was involved in the French invasion of Mexico. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> this is the second Franco-Mexican War of 1861 to 67. I was surprised too. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Maybe feel a little bit better about myself here. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, the French, they attempt to replace Mexico with a, a basically a friendly one under a French monarch. It doesn't work out too well. It only survives for a couple of years. It is actually recognized by a majority of European powers, but not by the United States. Right. Uh, okay. He is sent in 1866 to help train the Bakufu's army, and he arrives at only 28 years old in 1867. And he only trains the armies for a year, and the Bakufu falls. At the outbreak of the Boshin War, France decides on a policy of neutrality, because obviously you don't want to get inside on either side and one that might lose. However, Brunet resigns his commission and continues to fight on. Uh, the French diplomatic services in Japan are outraged and <laughs> doing their best to reduce the political impact of a random young officer resigning with a group of other people. It's not just him uh, to fight with the people they were training. However, after the quick fall of Edo, uh, Brunei and the Admiral Enomoto Takiyaki uh, fled to Sendai and then Ezo, which is modern day Hokkaido. They established the Republic of Ezo which is an attempt to model a state based on the United States with a voting democracy. Uh, only samurai can vote, by the way. And... Sounds a little biased from the start. <laughs> yeah. And Brunei essentially becomes de facto Minister for Foreign Affairs and joint in head of the army. And how much is his own self-aggrandizement here? Because he writes his own, he writes obviously about his own life. And how much is like other people talking about him? This is a quote from an anonymous French army officer from the time. The simple Japanese are puppets whom he manipulates with great skill. He has carried out a veritable 1789 French revolution in this brave new Japan. He sounds surprisingly good at getting what he well maybe not what he wants but getting a job done and i i mean this is fascinating because 
there is no inkling of this obviously in the film mm -hmm. <laughs> like mm -hmm. i think having that in the film would have been i want to i want to film about the that would be the the, do, the domain of azor i would be interesting however the main problem is they also then lose the azor leader enomoto takiyaki actually survived and is rehabilitated with the imperial government and he goes on to become their ambassador to russia however the french advisors flee again because they're on the losing side. However, <laughs> they go back to Yokohama, where there's a French delegation, and they are arrested by the representatives of the French government and sent back to France. Obviously, the Japanese government want him punished, but due to his popularity at home, he essentially just gets a slap on the wrists. <laughs> he goes on to serve France in the Franco-Prussian War. He doesn't even get kicked out the army. I think Heather belief here about everything she's hearing <laughs> they just keep going is there something else beyond this i feel like there might be something else they not only forgive brunei's actions but he's awarded medals he he dies in 1911 at the age of 73 and i don't think he ever returns to japan i wasn't expecting it to go there but i am not surprised that he got oh have go some medals where? Too. it went this way and that way and everywhere <laughs> still, very, very up here as opposed to where you would think like, oh, just cause rebellion and whole forces and people dying. But here, have some medals. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's it's a fascinating, I think, more confusing life than Tom Cruise's one. The important thing is he doesn't get to retire to the Japanese countryside. True. Tom Cruise got lucky. But now we need the life of Watanabe Ken's character, or the character it's based on, which is Saigo Takamori. Mm. Now, The Last Samurai is a popular moniker for Saigo Takamori, partially also because Saigo... The name sounds like Saigo, last. which also means last. Exactly. So his name is literally almost sounds like last. He's born in 1828 in Satsuma province in Kyushu. The first time he really comes to prominence is when his lord dies, uh, Shimazu Nariakira, uh, in 1858. And he is persuaded not to commit ritual suicide or Junshi, mm. which is outlawed at the time. Basically, right. when your lord dies, the expectation that his retainers would commit suicide with him. After this, he didn't get on with his Lord's successors and the central government try and take him into custody. However, this is failed after Saigo jumps into a bay alongside his compatriot, a monk called Gesho, uh, who was the one who persuaded him not to commit suicide the first time. Mm -hmm. Saigo survives this, but Gesho does not. And this is seen as very much this kind of the creation of him as this kind of very like i have survived for some reason what is it i i will do something with my life um however it is also at this time that he contracts a nasty case of a parasitic infection uh in his private parts okay oh, dear. which causes severe swelling for the rest of his life i mean that's just unfortunate that's not <laughs> You've, if I ever rewatch the movie, it's now ruined for me. So I'm just going to be imagining that horror the whole time. <laughs> he goes into exile, and he's come. He has a cycle of going in and out of exile at this point, depending on is he in favor or not. In 1864, he is appointed head of the Satsuma Army in Kyoto, and this is about the time of the first conflict between the Bakufu and Choshu Domain. Mm. Then, crucially, at the start of the Boshin War, he's there when the Shogun steps down, and he is one of the main people who is like, no, we need to punish the Shogun for what he did. And he leads a force that defeats an army three times its size. Oh, wow. So he is, he is good at his job. Yeah. Specifically because of his modernization. His troops are good, they have new rifles, they are well briefed, they are not only using their swords in the traditional way of the samurai. Mm -hmm. Guns have a long history in Japanese warfare, which you can hear in some of our other episodes. But there is a, a very much a language of, because Japan is a kind of time of peace in the 16, 1700s because of its seclusion, that they kind of abandon the gun. And that's not so strictly true, though some scholars do disagree. He then continues to fame throughout the Boshin War. He becomes part of the new government. Uh, he's in charge of organizing the new army of conscripts. This also being around the time the samurai class and the daimyo system are replaced, which he's probably not too happy with. Uh, Kyushu has long been a place of very much samurai extremism. You heard of Dr. Alexander Bennett, the, the Hagakure, one of like the big samurai things that comes later. That's written in, in Kyushu, this island, what is now Saga Prefecture. 
But there was a point in 1872 where he was a key advisor to what was then a placeholder government, because essentially most of the senior politicians travel to Europe to revise unequal treaties. So he has a lot of power at this time. However, he is super against railways, like Watanabe Ken's character. That is actually something they keep. However, it's not because he's against modernization. He just wants that money to go to reinforcing the army. Let's not spend money on trains. Let's spend them on new guns instead. And this is where one of the big disagreements comes in 1873. He has a disagreement over a response to Korea. One of the reasons that Saigo wants to go and there's a disagreement is he wants to go to Korea and essentially act so badly that they have a reason to assassinate him and therefore Japan then has a reason to invade. The rest of the Japanese government go, no. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm not surprised the government said no to that. <laughs> <laughs> Why that? <laughs> like, how did he come up with that idea? I mean, he can, you know, conquer like, larger armies, but go obviously and act bad in another country to get killed. That's not the smartest move there. He saw the government's eventual thing is to basically bombard cities and claim there are some naval problems, which then give them a reason to invade. He kind of sees this as a dishonorable approach. So it's the idea of he is sacrificing his life for the greater good, for the honor of the whole. Um, yeah. This ends up in a war with Korea that Japan win, ends up with a very unequal treaty that leads to the eventual annexation of Korea in 1910. Mm. Uh, Saigo then retires this year, and it's obviously feared that this guy might lead a military coup. However, he just goes back to Satsuma, he retires... But he does help to start a series of schools that are essentially military training academies <laughs> for young boys. Okay. So let's just ignore the ex-military member of the government who is training essentially a paramilitary group that are loyal only to him. I mean, there's a lot of red flags there. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> A lot of the new government are scared uh, because he's basically saying they've betrayed the expel the barbarian point of Sun or Joy, and therefore yeah. they're not revering the emperor enough. And essentially all these like betrayed samurai and stuff, they come together with him. The central government do send some men to Satsuma to try and deal with him, uh, but they're captured and under torture, they admit they were there to assassinate Saigo. In 1877, scared that there's going to be a rebellion, they start to remove weapons from the arsenal in Kagoshima so they can't get their hands on them. This provokes open fighting with Saigo's students, who then ro raid local army supplies and naval bases. And so this starts the rebellion that the movie's based on. And basically the students go to Saigo and go, my lord, my lord, we've started a rebellion. And he's like, wait, what? Oh, because <laughs> uh, there's not a lot of evidence that he's directly involved in like the start of it. But he's like, now it has started. It is my job to. There are other smaller samurai rebellions at this time, but he doesn't link up with them. This is one thing that lots of scholars are a bit confused about. There's a failed lack of coordination, but there's also this samurai like ideal that he's fighting with that means that lots of peasantry who like volunteer like yeah i want to fight with you you're the legendary saigo takamori he is he essentially disregards them that no fighting is only for the samurai you're right mm. however that definitely includes guns remember he's one of the biggest proponents of modernization so he's he goes okay we've got all my men we are going to march on tokyo and make the government listen to me and go, I've got all these disaffected samurai, you're doing stuff wrong. How far do you think Kyushu is to Tokyo? <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been to Kyushu once on the Shinkansen, and it still takes the whole day to get there. Mm -hmm. So I cannot imagine I mean, especially if you're against trains, like well, on horses or walking. That's... Because in the film they don't they well, don't really explain where they are. That's... It's just like, oh we're on the way to Tokyo and they're there in a day. <laughs> well, that's why I asked the professor, I'm like, wait, where is this supposed to be held at? He's like, oh well it's Kyushu and I was like, but Kyushu is like that's like the island at the well it's not south of Japan. It looks south, but it's the farthermost island and um, there's no way they could get there. Like it's for a drive in a car from like Hiroshima Prefecture to Tokyo. It's a 
good day trip just driving in a car. <laughs> yeah. So it's roughly, I, I planned this out, as the crow flies, it's 600 miles or <laughs> roughly a thousand kilometers. Um, so he's like, okay, I know this. Before I go, I'm going to take Kumamoto Castle, which is essentially his flank. So he can't be attacked from behind. However, after a lot of fighting, he's unable to take the castle. And by the way, during all this time, he's wearing his old Imperial Army uniform. Like mm. he's not wearing a samurai armor. He's wearing the uniform of the Imperial Army. That he's like, no, I am still loyal. I'm still working for the Emperor. And his ally, the governor, is captured. And after very heavy fighting, he is killed or commits seppuku, ritual suicide, depending on who you believe. There's huge arguments over this in the literature. One of the main arguments is we have his autopsy. He is shot through the, basically through the leg at, mm. his, at his waist. And so people theorize that he died like that. And also because of his aforementioned unfortunate illness, um, yes. he would it would have been very difficult for him to basically sit in the traditional position for seppuku, uh, um. like kneeling. And there are also no wounds on his chest. One of the main parts is, if people don't know, is essentially taking a knife and, and stabbing yourself. However, he is decapitated. So there is an argument. At one element of seppuku is as you reach for the knife. To do that, you are then beheaded by your second. However, there are other theories that essentially he dies of being shot. One of his allies essentially cuts off his head to go, oh no, he died doing seppuku, guys. Hmm. This story goes really well with the invention of Bushido at the time, as Dr. Oh, yeah. Bennett said. This is like this idea of the suicide. The stories are told of, of he faces towards Tokyo as he does it, to face towards the emperor. Basically, that means he's able to criticize the government, or this idea is able to criticize the government, whilst revering the emperor still. Which is very much actually alike to the movie, except oh, yeah. without without Tom Cruise being there. Um, <laughs> however, there is like some conspiracy theories almost about his death. Uh, during that year, Mars is very bright and there are some writings that he essentially ascends to Mars <laughs> after his death to look on over Japan. Who came up with this? <laughs> this is like at the time. There are like drawings oh, from the time of his like spirit being in like Mars. But it feels like such a modern type conspiracy theory. Like it's like Kangime going back to the moon. Kangyohime should say, Oh by the way, I live on the moon. Bye. Just He's going to Mars. to Mars. There are also some theories that he fakes his death and escapes to Russia. But we have his autopsy, lest we yeah. forget. <laughs> like, someone saw the body. And I guess if he went to Mars it was just his spirit soul. That's true. You don't need the body. And historian Ivan Morris basically argues that Saigo Takamori, he's one of this special kind of hero who Japan loved. He knows he could not succeed, but he fights on. The Last Samurai and Orientalism. So now we are going to look at film and this idea of film as something we can experience history through. Especially yeah. this idea of Zen Buddhism. We're going to use a lot uh, at this point for an article by Mina Shin on The Last Samurai, but I'll also be quoting some articles throughout here. But a lot of this is film studies more work. It's very important to start with one writer who's an expert in this called Richard Dyer from uh, essays called Only Entertainment. Any entertainment carries assumptions about and attitudes towards the world, even if these are not the point of the thing, and the fact that an entertainment entertains does not let it off the hook of social responsibility. It does not make up for sexism, racism, or any other deleterious ism. Movies always have some kind of message they're sending. Yeah. They might not endorse it, and also movies are different to everyone. One of the things that I think will help us talk a little bit about this is here is Dr. E. Taylor Atkins on his opinion of the last samurai there's a white supremacist underlying tone of that whole thing and i i wrote this top 10 list of things that you learn in scare quotes from that movie and one of them is that you know if you're white you get to be the the last samurai because that's who the last samurai is it's not watanabe it's tom cruise and you know he kills somebody and then later on that person's wife starts looking at him you know romantically there's the scene where you know, he spends four months learning to 
you know, to fight like a samurai, mushin, you know, no mind fighting techniques. And he beats up five guys who've done that their entire lives. But the, all that said, the romanticization of the samurai begins back in, you mentioned the tale of the Heike, in those gunkimono. And those were, you know, essentially a form of propaganda to persuade common people that warriors were these wonderful people and that's why they're in charge. The kabuki theater, the puppet theater in the Edo period made these heroic characters who, who did exemplify that, that samurai ideal. Let's, let's be clear about this. The Western notions of the ideal samurai come from Japanese depictions of the ideal samurai. The thing that's important to note though is that in those in other puppet plays, like by Chikamatsu, in some kabuki plays, and I talk about this in the in the book, you have common people who act like samurai. They adopt those values, they behave with honor, they're selfless and self-sacrificing, and all of that sort of thing. Now, on the one hand, that is a big statement uh, about you know com common people having uh, worth, being worthy, right? And samurai not always living up to it, or you know, you've got common people here exemplifying this ideal. The other side of that coin, however, is what I call hegemony, where the common people adopt the elite values as their own. And they rather than questioning them, whether you know, rather than saying, well, there's some aspects of this that are you know cruel and unjust and, and we're getting screwed by it, they adopt that value system as their own and try to prove their worth on that by that standard. I mean, I was going to say, like, with him saying, like, it becomes that uh, the white man is the less samurai. Like, I think I always saw the film as differently. Like, I never took it as he was the less samurai. I took it as, like, he was the defender of the last samurai. And, like, like, he helped him to be the last samurai who went into battle to, you know, show he still protected the emperor and that... Like, he was there to make sure the last samurai got to die honorably like he wanted. Because I feel that if... Because when he went to back to the village, my assumption was always, like, he went to live his life and not be a samurai anymore. Like He takes the place of a samurai. The main problem that m most people have with the last samurai is that he doesn't die. If he dies, it's kind of fine. Watanabe is then the last samurai. However, he is literally at the end holding the sword. He is passing on the samurai legacy to the Emperor Meiji. And at that point, the samurai in the room is not the emperor. It's Tom Cruise. So one of the reasons that I was never interested in this movie, like I, I didn't have any interest because mm. I, at the time, thought that the movie was Tom Cruise was the last samurai. I don't know if I'd heard the criticism or if it was my perception. It's been a while now, so it's the reason I never encountered it. In the initial stages of the movie, I was thinking, like, more of what you were saying, Thomas, that, oh, he's going to be just there. He's just an accompaniment. But the very last where he dons the armor and rides into battle, it did almost have that feeling as well. So well, that also then kind of colors that. But that was my perception is that he can't be a samurai. He's kind of like a stand in, but he's again, he's not Japanese. He can't become samurai because he's a foreigner but the the film does also the writing would make it seem from like a western perspective i i think you saw me do a double take when yeah. i saw tom cruise walking through the door i went why is he alive <laughs> why is he here <laughs> this is what uh, vincent m gain calls the last white man standing it's essentially the idea that the indigenous culture, whether it be in something like uh, Last of the Mohicans or Dances with Wolves, uh, that essentially the indigenous culture is less important than one guilt-ridden American. This entire conflict is to do with Tom Cruise having a redemptive cycle. Richard Slotkin comes to the idea of a gunfighter nation, that this is a myth of a frontier, so in, in the idea of like Westerns, uh, that then Mina Shin turns into this idea of Japan and this samurai Western that the last samurai ends up becoming. That's yeah. this idea that there is these genocides, these conflicts that we cannot fix, that the, the main character cannot do. It, it is inevitable, which is, again, a, a problem. But it is basically a justification 
like the end of modernization of all these things that it had to happen so X would happen. Yeah. In the end, if Tom Cruise hadn't massacred all those Native Americans, he wouldn't have been there to save the day. That is true. I feel that, yeah, like you said, it became a film about him redeeming himself. Like, mm -hmm. that whole backstory was there so that, in essence, when this battle did come around, it was like, this time I'm going to fight on the side I should have fought on the first time. And, yeah, the battle becomes more about not the guy's rebellion against the emperor and modernization, but more about, like, I have to be here. Like, yes, I've been protecting him and we've become friends and all that throughout the film, but now it's, I have to be here to do the right thing, even though he then encourages him at the end to be like, we can't win, let's all go and die anyway. <laughs> well, the you're right, because if he hadn't been there, he would not have um, rescued um, from the small shack that he was imprisoned in. And then he also wouldn't have come up with the whole theory of let's draw them away with their guns and bring them in this little pass and so he came up with the two strategies that actually caused them to be exactly able he to... caused all everyone in mm -hmm. essence to die for his own redemption because if he hadn't have been there like he would have committed re seppuku himself in the little the prison he was in and meaning his people. son wouldn't have died all meaning he wouldn't, wouldn't have had to bring his army into battle they would have stayed where they were and all mm -hmm. that death for one man wanting to be on the right side this time of history. And this leads on to an idea that even portraying the samurai themselves as honourable can be problematic and difficult. So here's E. Taylor Atkins on one of the reasons he hates the last samurai. It, it makes it look like, you know, samurai are right there as equals with farmers and, you know, they all live are living together harmoniously and that sort of thing. But it totally overlooks how you got to that point. And it's just not realistic anyway. And it's just a way of romanticizing them. And, and I can't stand it. I can't, I, you know, it really makes me mad that samurai are held up as such wonderful people. They had this amorphous code that really wasn't a code until you know, late 19th, early 20th century. Those were ideals of conduct. And when you have ideals, I mean, that, that doesn't, number one, it doesn't mean people lived up to them. And one of the reasons you respect people who did live up to them is because most people weren't doing that. What Mina Shin writes, they kind of depict Japan as a Zen country. Like all the, as you said, everything is like in temples, etc which is not very much mainstream Japan. You get a very idealized view of Japan from the film, um, which is the problem with most movies, especially if it's about something that has so much history. They only want to show the good and the idealized version of everything. Like, like he said, showing the samurai being alongside the farmers and everyone being a collective community and not the caste system that Japan mm -hmm. had. And I feel that it's also a problem that you get in a lot of history books like the stuff me and heather do for our research we try to get more academic history books or more academic journals because if you rely on more generic history books like you get in school or just from a generic bookstore like even they give you the idealized version idealized for themselves as well as the whole world the, the glimpses of japan we saw we didn't really see much of japan i didn't feel but you saw mount fuji Oh my gosh! Saw Mount Fuji from the boat. As soon as I saw, I was like, "You can't see that." I think yeah, the film took as many, I guess, symbols of Japan they mm. could to make people think, "Oh, this is a Japanese film." You saw Fuji. You it was set during cherry blossoms. You had one scene with the wisteria in the background of the imperial palace. The, but and then yeah, the, yeah, wisteria the temples and the were cherry there. Blossoms aren't at the same yeah, time. it's not at the same time. But there was cherry blossoms, and there was wisteria, and then there was cherry blossoms again on the battlefield. Just all these things to keep reminding, like, these are the symbols of Japan. This is a Japanese story when the, the imagery used isn't needed. This is something interesting that Mina Shin connects to the idea of Orientalism. Yeah. Uh... I will quote directly from our article here. In Orientalism, the Orient is believed to have the spiritual mystic power to cure the West, because the West has lost the ability to heal itself. Losing innocence is a price the West paid in the process of modernization and civilization. 
While the Orient is the object of conquest, its spirituality should be preserved so the West can come back whenever it misses and needs its spiritual other. The spiritual Orient is, in fact, a mirror image of the West itself, the lost, innocent self. The Orient exists for the West, for whatever purposes. In this case, for personal healing. This is one of the basic tenets of Orientalism, and The Last Samurai faithfully follows its logic. Japan exists for Nathan Algren. Nathan Algren does not exist for Japan. I kind of see it. Like, definitely now, like, you see a lot of, even when people are coming, like, oh, where are you going on holiday? Like, I'm going to Asia because I want to relax and desensitize from the West. I just want to meditate and find nature and inner peace and that. And there is definitely still that imagery. Or even if you're in your own country, it's like, I need that place of Zen. You go to a place that is designed to feel, I guess, Oriental. The idea I have had of Japan before I came to live here was you know, definitely... I, I feel like most people really do. When you come to think about living in Japan, you have an idea of what it's going to yep. be like. And then you come in and have that day to day and, you know, it becomes your life. It becomes like, you know, your home environment and you become accustomed to it. But more specifically to Last Samurai, it's also very interesting when it comes out. It Because it is this idea of you have this masculine modern nation of Japan that successfully militarizes like the United States. A lot of this is from Mina Shin's article. But then, this is so this is essentially a glorification of Japanese militarism. And this movie comes out in 2003. What invasion happens in 2003? 2003. It, it's the invasion of Iraq. Badly timed film? Intentionally timed film? Mina Shin writes about American Marines at the time after they watched the movie, and how they identified with the samurai. Mm. It's Japanese success, which doesn't imply the then next 50, 60 years of Taiwan, Korea, the yeah. Philippines, China, etc. Which it can't do. It, mm -mm. Practically it can't do. But also, not everything has to be a film. True. Not everything needs to be made into a movie. Are some films that are made that shouldn't be made. <laughs> I asked E. Taylor Atkins this, and here's his theory on why the West loves this image of the samurai so much. I think one of the reasons that Western people like samurai so much is the this idea that they were they're incorruptible, that um, money doesn't mean anything to them, that they fight for noble causes and honor. Again, whatever that is, the idea that that they're not for sale. I think is very appealing to cynical societies where they think everything is for sale. There's a theory by a Swiss writer named Alain Debouton, who says that our tastes are shaped by what we feel we lack. So we're drawn to things that we feel we, we either don't live up to or that we don't have. And uh, that would be an example that we, we're not a culture of honor. We're a culture of, of money and uh, compromise and things like that. And so I think that's one of the reasons why people like samurai so much. I think they also like them so much because of Star Wars, because they, they know that Jedi come from samurai. And I think that's not an insignificant factor in the attraction of samurai. And it's just a night in a different culture as well. So it's that same ideals, but put into different outfit into that idealized society as well yeah but also maybe because i mean we have our knight in shining armor movies mm. a lot but maybe as well it's more relatable now because samurai is set in a more modern time so you can easily more relate to the idea of honor it's like people can still be honorable even in a city like in a modern society and not mm. just back in the day when you were saving a damsel in distress from a dragon or something like, you can see it in a real setting. Hmm. Or a setting in which uh, people identify with more. But for a lot of historians who engage with movies and popular culture, a lot of the aim is to create an emotional connection with the past. Not an accurate connection with the past, but something that lets you try and emulate and feel similar things and feel that people at this time were people, not just pictures on a page. It's quiz time. 
Oh no. Oh no, there's a quiz. He's uh, already quizzed me and I've not done great. <laughs> so I'm not I'm not sure about this. <laughs> Question one. What is the name of the period that ends just before the Meiji period? Edo period. Question two. What is the Japanese term for the military government that ruled from Edo? I don't know. The Bakufu. Question three. Name the two rebellious domains during the Boshin War. Satsuma. Was it Izo? It wasn't. Izu. No, it is Choshu. Choshu. Choshu which is modern day Yamaguchi or part of modern day Yamaguchi. Ah, okay. Also, the Toza get involved a little bit later. But no, I'll mm. give you half a point. You get half a point. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what does the Japanese term Meiji mean? Enlightenment. Oh, that's another. Something. That's a half point. That's a it's half enli- point. Enlightened rule. Enlightened Light. rule. Come on, Heather, help me. <laughs> yeah, the enlightened part I knew was half missing, so that was your contribution. She was like, oh, you're half right. <laughs> Question five. What nationality is the historic figure that Nathan Olgren is based on? Oh, that one's easy as French. There you go. Thank you for giving well me done. one. You threw me a ball. <laughs> Bless you. Where does he go to help found a republic that only existed for six months? Oh, that was in Hokkaido. Azor. It was then called Ezo. It starts being called Hokkaido just after. Question seven. Saigo Takamori resigned from the Meiji government over a disagreement with what country? Korea. Question eight. What planetary body did some think that Takamori had ascended to after his death? Mars! Mars. (laughs) Question nine. What genre of traditional movie does Dr. Mina Shin compare The Last Samurai to? Isn't it Western? Western, correct. And question 10. What part of the US armed forces did Shin state identified with the samurai in the movie? The Marines. Your score at the end is 9 out of 10. Yay! Yay! I'm pretty happy with that. I, you know, he didn't say this in the very intro part. <laughs> yeah, we weren't. We didn't know about this. I'm glad this there is, was a surprise quiz. I actually enjoyed this. This is lovely. <laughs> So thank you so much for coming on. And you know, something I, I was expecting to talk about, we didn't talk about was Ninja. That was an interesting scene. So that's something we should talk again because I want to talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> I, we mostly didn't talk about that because it made me so angry. Um, <laughs> they should not have been there. They You're, did not exist we anymore. Like, what? What? This is wrong. <laughs> One thing I do recommend everyone is from our wonderful historians today, Dr. E. Taylor Atkins and Dr. Alexander Bennett. Their writing is really wonderful. Dr. Atkins has a second edition of his book, The History of Popular Culture in Japan, coming out this fall, which I highly recommend. It's very readable, and he's just a wonder he's a wonderful writer. I I have devoured the first edition. Dr. Bennett also has many works on the history of martial arts and warrior culture, along with the history of kendo as well. And they are available from all good retailers. Guys, where can we find you if we want to hear more from you? Uh, So if you want to check out our show, um, we are the Japan Archives. We're basically on as many different platforms that you could find us. Um... But I think I think for us, if you are interested in checking out, like you've said before, um, we try to do it weekly, and every now and then we do um extra bonus episodes during the week. We always do two different parts. We keep it very casual, where one of us is more in the know, so it lets us have like a discussion. And normally we have a main topic about something that is historical based or mythological based, and then we always finish up with a, I call it the Heather's Corner. Um, where she will read as a song or a poem in Japanese. And then again, we talk about like the meanings behind it and our interpretations, which again can be interesting being from a more Western perspective. Non academic. <laughs> mm. So, yeah, if you are interested in Japanese history, check us out as well. We'd love some new listeners. We're always happy for new listeners. <laughs> as a last note, I'd like to thank everyone for listening. This is going to be the final episode of season one. If you'd like a season two, share this with your friends, leave good reviews uh, on the platform of your choice. I will say the biggest way that podcasts grow is by word of mouth. So if you really like this podcast, you you like Thomas and Heather's podcast, share it with a friend. And you can also recommend, say, guests and media you want us to look at on our website, which is www.japanhiddenhistorypodcast.com where you can also hear some of the full interviews we have from our guest historians, find the bibliography behind all the episodes, and read some upcoming articles about the history behind some of the movies we've looked at. Uh, You can also keep up to date with us. We'll be on all the social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, uh, with all the links in the show notes. It's just finally to say, again, 
Thank you, everyone, for listening. Also, there's going to be a survey so I can judge the effectiveness of this podcast and hopefully make a better <laughs> one in the future. So I'd super appreciate you filling it in if you've enjoyed the almost five hours of free content I've worked on for you. Uh, but with that last mouthful done, I will hopefully see you all again soon. <laughs>